Joe, you're looking good up there. Yeah, I think so. Thanks. <laughs> okay, buddy. Hey, Joe, you're looking like your dad more and more every day. Oh, geez, I'd never heard that one before. I don't know. It's a, it's a good thing. What's he doing, Joe? He's doing okay. Had good. a visit with him yesterday. He's doing all right. Good, good. You tell him I said hi, eh? Yeah, will do. Just waiting for a couple more to log in here. So uh, we'll be a couple minutes starting. Hey, good afternoon, Council. Uh, it's an early meeting. I'm glad everybody's here. So uh, before, before we start the meeting, I want to uh, just uh, make a statement here. Um, before we start, I want to make a pu uh, the public to be aware that myself and many of the colleagues at the Council table have issued public statements stating that we do not agree with recent comments made on social media by one of our councillors. I've also, I have also called for an apology, but these are not the words of our council. I want, I want the public to be aware of that and I want council to be aware of that. This is, uh, this, there's a process in place 
for code of conduct violations by the council uh, through by a council member through the integrity commissioner's office. I understand that many of the community members are seeking immediate action and will be frustrated by this delay. But I ask this process to be followed and please be respected. As a result, today at this meeting is not the proper form to discuss this matter further. And I ask everyone here to respect that so that we can continue to bring on the business of the town of Essex. So thank you very much. So I'm gonna call the meeting to order. Uh, is there any conflict of interest amongst any of the council members here tonight? Seeing none, I need a motion for the adoption of this published agenda this afternoon. Can I have a mover, please? Uh, Councillor Guerin and a seconder, please. Uh, Councillor Bowman. All in favor? That's carried. And we're gonna move into uh, committee on the whole. And uh, before we do that, I, I'd like to uh, counsel to make a motion that we appoint Chris Nepsey to be uh, presiding officer over the committee of the whole. Could I have a mover please? On this one, uh, Councillor Bjorkman and Councillor Bowman. All in favor? That's carried. Okay. Yeah, now I need a motion to move into uh, committee on the whole, please. Uh, Deputy Mayor Malash and Councillor Guerin, all in favor? That one's carried, thank you. And we'll go uh, into Chris, go ahead. Okay, thank you, uh, your worship. Um, again, uh, similar to the mayor, welcome everybody. I know it's an early meeting. Uh, I think um, following our last month's committee, the whole meeting on infrastructure, uh, the format was successful, similar format. We're going to uh, tag each item for 15 minutes. Uh, we'll have the counselor who initiated the item to be brought forward and put on the list uh, to give a little bit of a, a brief summary on, on why they want it there and what they want to discuss about. Uh, and we'll move forward uh, with any conversation that follows. Um, and we'll go from there. Any questions on the format? Any, uh, any issues or concerns that way? No, I see none. Okay, so well, let's get right into it. I know time is valuable for everybody. So the first item on the list is the Colchester Schoolhouse, including landscaping. This issue was brought for uh, Councillor Bondi. So Councillor Bondi, if you want to step in and give us a bit of a summary. I know I added also, uh, Deputy Mayor Malash had an item about landscaping, but it dealt with the schoolhouse. So I kind of uh, dovetailed those two together. So Councillor Bondi, the floor is yours. Actually, I'd like to pass the floor to the deputy mayor because this has been a, a long list and uh, I, I just think it's a topic to, uh, to discuss the landscaping and the Colchester Schoolhouse, but I'll let the deputy mayor uh, lead because his brain is probably fresher on this. Uh, thanks, okay. Councillor Bond. Uh, Mr. Uh, Chris, is that okay? Mr. Nepsey, yeah. Uh, so I, I think, uh, uh, Councillor Bondi and myself probably have similar views on this. Uh, I, I know one of the things that I expressed was that piece of property, uh, you know, we're expecting to have uh, tourism and build our tourism portfolio in that area. Uh, we do have events such as, I want to say, uh, the Explore the Shore, where this would be uh, uh, one of the sites, perhaps, you know, once it's developed and once we have um, the schoolhouse in operation. Uh, hopefully they can have uh, perhaps artists, uh, local artists uh, showing off their works or winery setting up uh, perhaps that's not right on the route. Maybe one of the wineries like Mushedre's uh, could uh, move in closer to the route to, to uh, show off their products. Um, and who, who else, who knows what else could happen there. But at the same time, I believe and when we first purchased the property, the intent was to have this property landscape and, and we can possibly have Mr. Sweet speak to that in that regard uh, later after I'm done here. But, um, you know, with some, uh, it was the intention was to have um, um, Nathan, uh, who is a landscaped artist, um, 
do something with the property similar to what we have. We already have a, a nice um, uh, parquet in uh, downtown Harrow. We have a nice parquet in downtown McGregor. Um, you know, we're going to be developing Heritage Village or Heritage Village, Heritage Park in um, in uh, Essex Center. Uh, this is something that we can develop and, and maybe make a, a, a passive park um, out of rather than a busy park like Jackson Park, uh, you know, just to build up the area and make it look a lot nicer uh, with some some bushes and some trees, native trees and, and so on. But Nathan has the ability to do that. And originally that was part of the plan uh, going back a few years ago. I just think it's uh, it's time to move forward on this. You know, it's been brought, it's been highlighted and I think it's time. That's all I've got to say on it. Thanks. Hey, thanks, Deputy Mayor. Um, I, in, in my excitement to get this started, I should have let Doug uh, introduce his team that's here tonight for the public that's watching as well. Because I think a lot of public, you know, they're familiar with the director's faces and some of the managers, but I'd like Doug maybe before he answers that to go through who he's here and their function um, so that they truly understand the community services um, department. So Doug, if you can do that first, before you start to respond to Deputy Mayor Malosh, I would. Thank you, Chair Nepsey. I can understand this is an exciting topic, so how you could forget that, but I do appreciate it. Um, so people can see on our screen, we do have uh, the three managers of our division. So we have Chief Rick, Rick Arnell, oversees the fire department, our manager of recreation and culture, Cynthia Cakebread, and newly hired Jake Morissette of our parks and facilities division. So I thought it was important that they're also part of these meetings. Um, based on the previous ones, probably a lot of council myself talking, but if there's any specific questions, I think it's good for them to answer, but also to hear what council's direction is. So if council's good with that, it can kind of proceed further with the Colchester Schoolhouse kind of address Deputy Mayor's questions. So to start off right now, currently the, the town has no funding allocated for any work at the schoolhouse. Um, it is, in our minds, considered a passive park. So as Deputy Mayor said, it wouldn't be where it's active and playgrounds and it is for uh, passive use. However, with all that being said, last Friday, um, our manager of planning, our director of uh, development services met with Heritage Colchester. We met with them to kind of get an idea what the, they're looking for. And they are looking at doing some fundraising events this summer on the property. And I think it's important that if they're gonna have a stake in it, that we work with them in terms of the landscaping. I think it's important that we do some landscaping there um, and fix it up. But for example, we don't wanna put a, a gazebo or something in a spot and maybe they have a different vision for it. So I think it's important to work with them. And with that being said, one of the recommendations from our meeting was we probably should look at entering an operating lease agreement with them, similar to what we have with Eckers, with its Carnegie, Carnegie Hall here in Essex Center. And the reason for that is it's a commitment on both parties. So they know that the town is committed to them. So if they apply for some grants, they can use that, but also the town has a commitment that someone's trying to do something with that, that building, but also the surrounding property. So that's kind of a recommendation. And with that, then I think they could look at enhancing that area more and it's easier sometimes for these groups to get grants than it is for the town. So I'm not sure any other further questions or um, other work maybe that we could partake on that property. Uh, Deputy Mayor? I would tend to agree with what uh, Director Sweet is saying. Um, the grant uh, situation is much more uh, re readily available for organizations what it is for the town in that regard and that's the reason why we uh, set up Essex Heritage Committee for the Essex train station uh, because they were able to get a lot more money more readily than uh, what we could for the train station so uh, I think that's an excellent idea and uh, a good approach and thank you for reaching out to that committee and uh, you know trying to coordinate what's going to be done by the town and what's going to be done by the committee thanks Mayor, does anyone else have any questions or comments with respect to the Colchester Schoolhouse? Uh, Councillor Bjorkman. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Um, yeah, you know, we've, uh, I'm thrilled that the, the Schoolhouse Committee is now uh, in operation and that we're looking at landscaping and looking at that property. I think we need to look at that property um, really as a whole. 
there's a there's a lot of property there. Now, does all of that property need to be kept as passive park and kept for the schoolhouse? Or is some of that property, are we able to divest ourselves of some of that? Does it make sense when we look at it? Is, is that entire area, which is now pretty much an L shape going around that corner, um, is all of that necessary uh, to, uh, to the town? And is it all in the vision of our uh, committee uh, to use all of that property because once again it, it's a lot of property and to get maximum use of it uh, we should come up with a vision there should be a an overall plan and if we can divest ourselves of some of it we know that that's very valuable property uh, in the in the village of Colchester and uh, we should make sure we're getting the most we can out of all of it um, I know I've brought up before that uh, I would not be averse to, to selling parts of that property in order to uh, you know, create that pool of money uh, to invest in other good things that we're doing down there. Now, if we've got a, a good cohesive plan that actually needs all that property, that's great. But again, we need to look at it all because it's a big chunk of land and make a plan for what we're gonna do with it. And if there is some there that we can divest ourselves of, I think that's a, it's a good thing to do for the town. Okay, thank you, uh, Councillor Bjorkman. Uh, I'm not sure, was there any, I guess any questions in there for Doug? Did you see anything that you wanted to comment on or, or provide additional detail? To go to Councillor Bjorkman's point, as I mentioned earlier, there's no plans for that, but I think after uh, further discussions with Heritage Colchester and get a feel what they're looking for, we would have an idea how much property is needed. I think 255, which is the north part of that lot, we would want to maintain for sure for parking. Um, but the rest, I agree, is a large parcel of land. Uh, and I think further discussions with them on their actual um, vision for that area would be required. Okay, excellent. Um, anyone else on the schoolhouse? Councillor Bowman, is that your hand there or are you? Yes, if I may, uh, and I realize we're in the early planning stages stages of this. Uh, and while it would be nice to divest some of the property to get some money to do this, uh, I think it's so important that the plan's in place first and, and sufficient parking is, is um, al allocated for the area to, to uh, accommodate what's planned in the future. Um, it's easy to, to divest, but it's awful hard to get it back. So uh, let's, let's get the plan in place first. Thank you. Just before um, we may move off culture to schoolhouse, I know there's an item later in the agenda about capital projects, but I think it's uh, a good time to bring it up now. In our discussions, Heritage Colchester will be getting an architect and someone going through to do assessment to see possibly what repairs are required on the inside to get it a public occupancy. With that being said, kind of the model that we've had, these are still town buildings and we maintain the, the core of the structure. That facility currently does not have heating or cooling and HVAC system. So depending what happens in the future, that may be something as a council that we may have to look at as a future capital budget. Um, but that will depend on what work and what their intent is. Okay, great. Um, we're on track then. Seeing no other uh, questions, comments, concerns with the schoolhouse, uh, we'll move on to item number two. Item number two is the sports fields, uh, the Essex sports fields. Both Councillor Garen and Deputy Mayor Malosh have... Um, put that as as their items uh to be identified so i'll defer to i think councillor garen was the first one so i'll, I'll deter, defer to councillor garen thank you chris through you um yep yeah, so this is a a large project that we had applied for a grant and uh weren't successful at getting it and um it still doesn't change the fact that we we, we do need this these fields um with the handling extension um in the near future coming up and all the construction going on, um, it's apparent that there's gonna be uh, 
a need for soccer fields for sure. And I'm not sure if we, where we're at with that. And uh, had a couple other things that came up recently too. Um, and I want to ask Doug if, uh, like, what type of backup plan do we have if, if, if we don't have the field ready to go? Uh, I know McGregor may be a solution, but they have their own soccer program as well. Um, Harrow may be also a solution with their fields. I, I think there's, um, there's, uh, they're not fully used, but I guess what type of backup plan are we looking at? Or, um, and then was there any thought ever given to, uh, this came up over the last couple of weeks about ex an accessible ball diamond, uh, something for the, uh, you know, wheelchair accessible or something with expanded dugouts and, uh, and uh, non-slip rubberized playing surfaces. Is that anything that, uh, that we considered in, in, in our past uh, um, planning? So hopefully this gets the ball rolling. Um, anxious to hear. Director Sweet. So if Councillor Garon, kind to, uh, if I'll get to his question, but I just kind of want to do a little background first, if he's okay with that on the sport fields. Shelly, if you don't mind putting up the, um, the picture of the sport fields. Four. Uh, did it come up? Sorry about that. Uh, great. This one? So just to start, yeah. So that's the original, um, the plan we have where we apply for the grant of 20 point, basically $6 million. Um, you can see the soccer fields, the stadium, the number of baseball diamonds, the washroom facilities, et cetera. And Shelley, if you can go to the next slide. From that, council gave us direction to look at what it would be cost for a phase-in and what is required for phase-in. So what you're seeing in front of you is if you did a phase project. Highlighted everything inside the yellow is all would be the phase-in. So at the very top of my screen, probably the same, you can see four large um, soccer fields and below that two mini soccer fields. And right below that is the main washroom electrical building. In the upper right is kind of the storage equipment area. Um, bottom left is where there'd only be two baseball diamonds and you'd have parking below the baseball diamonds and half a parking lot in the upper right. Entrance would be off Baden and in the bottom right where it's also high is storm water. A lot of the cost to do first phase in was 6.5 million because that's all your infrastructure that is required at that time. So water, sanitary, storm, electrical, and the grading. People have probably seen with uh, the expansion going on, we work with MTO and piling dirt currently over on that site um, to see if that ever happens. We could reduce the cost for phase in from 6.5 down to 5.7 if we removed half of the east parking lot. So in the upper, two of the mini soccer fields and one of the um, secondary washroom and two of the playgrounds. So there is an option to get the cost even down a little bit more. So to kind of go, um, that's kind of where we're being left with council said to look at phase one, that's where we're at. The other thing, if you notice from the phase is missing a stadium, that alone costs $9.5 million. So by removing that um, reduces the project, the total project by a great deal. So to go to council Garon's questions, when we looked at the phase in, soccer was our first priority because if Hanlon, not if, when Hanlon goes through, we're going to have to look for soccer. So if this field and this complex can be built, we have a plan for it. If not, um, what we've been talking about, and I'll let Jake jump in here in a second, is using our neighborhood parks. And Jake, I'm not sure if you want to maybe a few comments on that. Sure, so at this time, we've identified three parks that would be uh, able to accommodate some small fields. So we've got Bridlewood Park, uh, Hunter Park, and uh, Lions Club Park uh, at Stanton Court. So there is area in there where we can fit small uh, soccer pitches for users. Obviously we'd need nets, but the concern with uh, using the local fields would be public parking. You'd have an influx of parking in those areas during those times. Uh, which could disrupt neighbor, uh, the neighbors in the parking area. Thanks, Jake. And Councillor Garen, we haven't looked at what they call the, um, the totally accessible fields. Because right from the beginning, we basically, it's from our stakeholders. This was kind of the grassroots, what was asked for. Not saying that's something we couldn't look at in the future, but right now it's kind of meeting the um, basic needs. And I guess in terms of 
um, overseeing the area, the concern I have is right now the Essex Center has been short on outdoor sport fields just for grassroots use, right? We've been short right now. And with the development going on, you have the potential in the next few years with Townview, 600 homes, the demand's only gonna increase. So with that, it is gonna be a continual challenge. And I know the challenge is the grant. We're all very disappointed not getting any of that grant funding. I think we all thought that was gonna come. Um, so now how do we pivot? What do we do next? And I think that's kind of the direction we're looking for from council. Um, we'll give you some options, kind of we can use some neighborhood parks in the short term. There'll be some resident issues by that. Um, do we look at a, going ahead with something with phase one and slowly move forward? The mayor, the mayor, and then Councillor Verbeek. Thank you, Chris. Um, to Doug, um, and maybe to Jeff Morrison. Um, have we looked at long-term debt on on Phase One? I know um, we applied for grant money, and it doesn't look like we're going to get any grant money. And what's going on right now with this virus uh, and the money going out from the feds and the provincial government? I don't. I don't, I can't see a lot of grant money coming out. Have we, and I know the demands there. Have we looked at long-term debt, how we, and have we looked at the possibility of naming rights? Um, maybe we can get some, a good donation there through uh, putting it out for naming rights for that park. So that's just my question, Doug. I think there's a two-parter there. So, Director Morrison, if you want to speak a little bit on the finance uh, section and the long-term debt question, and then uh, Director Doug Sweet, <laughs> not Director Doug, uh, if you want to uh, speak to naming rights, I think I just recoined Doug's name there. But <laughs> through the through the chair, um, yeah, we've talked about debt. Realistically, debt is one of the only tools we can utilize for it. However, you got a Harrow streetscape and an Essex streetscape and a fire hall um, that are all being built. So it all depends on how much debt you want at the end of the day. Are we under our debt capacity? Yes, but what does that appetite look like? Um, strategically from a debt perspective, that isn't a bad thing if we can tie it to a sustainable funding. So we've talked internally that maybe once the waiver of development charges is phased out, that um, the money that's set aside to pay for those could then transition over to paying for the debt for the sports field um, that could create a sustainable model for us. Um, but until we free up some of these funds, it would just be debt that hits, uh, hits our debt level and we'd have to potentially raise those funds uh, annual commitment through property taxation increases. Thanks, Jeff. Sorry, I'm going to let um, Director Sweet answer a little on the naming rights, Councilor Rubrik, and then you're next. Thank you, Chair. So not only na naming rights were definitely would be something for this complex we look at and we'd go after. Um, fortunately, we've already had organizations approach us about naming rights. So hopefully they have that same appetite when this facility is here. But on top of naming rights, we would also be looking at sponsorships, different marketing and advertising would have to look at increasing user fees. So there's a number of different avenues in terms of increasing revenue for this complex, but the two largest one would be naming rights and sponsorships. Thanks, Doug. Uh, Councilor Verbeek. Okay, thank you through you, Mr. Chair. Um, just um, to comment on the sports fields, I, I again, love I love these and I want to see them go forward sometime in the future. And I do understand there's a need for them. I, I hear, you know, I just don't know that right now, even this term is the time to take on even more big debt related to the sports fields. Um, when, as you state, we have so many major projects right now on the go and in the queue. Right. Um, but um, that being said, um, I wonder like why when we sought out um, alternatives, temporary alternatives that may be for one, two, three, four seasons until we have this built. I mean, we're gonna get there, right? We're, get, we're gonna get this for Essex, but it, it just may not be this term or next. Um, 
why aren't we looking at COAN and our Harrow soccer fields um, as alternatives? Um, I know the three small parks right in the town center that were mentioned would probably create, would probably have some parking issues with them. Neither one of those facilities um, would have any problem handling the parking. I'm just wondering like, uh, why aren't we looking at ways to, to work around those beautiful facilities we have? Now, when I say beautiful at Coan, we all know they, those soccer pitches needs of the, uh, it's been on, it was on their wish list since long before I got on council to have some improvements and um, extensions to the, to the fields that they have. But I'm just, my question, I guess, is why aren't we looking at the facilities that we have to, you know, I mean, stay court, stay the course on the, getting this facility done, but just not taking on a whole bunch of debt right away for it um, and making do with what we have. Thank you. For you, Chair. It's not that we haven't looked at it, Council River Beak. Um, so Koyan Park, for example, they're limited themselves in terms of the soccer fields they have. So do you want to start bumping those current users? Harold Soccer Complex, yes, is under, try to get groups out there. The history, the culture of outdoor sports, be it baseball, soccer, people do not want to travel outside of their community for it. Not saying that's not an option, it just seems to be the nature of it. Um, where arenas, because they're larger facilities, people seem to travel. They don't seem to travel outside. So that's why we're trying to look at what's going to be a practical solution. And that's why we're trying to look within the ward itself. Not saying we would not promote those areas. We currently still promote Harrow Soccer, for example. I was hoping to get um, high school soccer out there this year in terms of their county tournaments and that. So we are looking at promoting it. Um, we would still promote it with two of our groups. It's just a matter if they would travel there. Many people have heard me say we need to do that slogan, Harrow and Colchester, it's really not that far. Garen. Oh, Councillor Garen. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, to Doug's point, I know in the past I've uh, offered other, like my ball league, I used to have a men's league. Um, you know, they would travel outside of Essex. You know, I, I really believe they, I don't know if they'll go to Harrow though. I remember when I used to run the ball hockey league in Essex and Essex Arena wasn't going to be ready. And they were asking us if we'd like to go play in Harrow and our, 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 our membership didn't want that. It was just too far of a drive for them. I know baseball is losing lots of participants just to St. Mary's. It's a lot closer. Um, I can make an argument. Maybe the company might even be closer. Um, one of the things that I would like to see though, on a temporary basis, I would think Doug that the, uh, at the, and, and it's, I'm not too sure because my son hasn't been involved in the soccer in a while, but it seems to be those junior ages is where they have the high numbers of, of registration, uh, be it J1, J2, the ones that use the smaller fields. Have we ever thought about maybe uh, entering an agreement with the high school and, and in the summer months when they're not open, using the large football field and putting three or four pitches on that sideways has a, a temporary solution. Um, McGregor, I think you're right. I don't believe they would have the, the space to accommodate us. Um, if they did, it may be midweek. On a, on a like we wouldn't have I think right now they, a lot of the soccer runs games are like Saturdays and maybe some Sundays but I don't know if McGregor would be a, a, a solution for all of soccer maybe for a couple of a pitches maybe yep Thank you Mr. Chair I have approached uh, the head of the department there to see and it may be a possibility it all depends on when they do they do their turf maintenance for the high school um Deputy Mayor Malash probably recalls this when we used to have the Fiddle Fest, we used to have to move soccer and all that. We used to use the neighborhood parks, but then we used to have the old Holy Name School. We used to have Maplewood and we were able to use those schools. Unfortunately, the new schools don't have those fields because that's how we partner in the past. Um, if there was property we could use, we would look at it. But to also your point, you're right, it's the junior ages is a large group, but the other large group is actually adults. We have an under 30 league and we have an over 30 league. So it's, it's a social element for your adults as well which need the larger field. So um, soccer in general is a booming sport. 
Thanks, Doug. Uh, Deputy Mayor Malosh, we're at our 15 minutes, but I'm okay to, I think we saved five minutes on the first one. So if, if, if I see general nods of council to continue on and, and use that five minutes for this five minutes, uh, seeing yes. Okay, Deputy Mayor Malosh. Thank you, uh, Chair Nepsey. Uh, just to um, go back to Director Sweet's uh, comment, I certainly do remember the days when uh, coaching soccer on school properties where they didn't cut the grass. We'd even have parents that would offer to cut the grass. Then we'd have problems with uh, the school board's union saying that uh, the soccer is taking away their jobs um, and so on. It was, it was a nightmare. And then you'd have potholes in the property. You weren't allowed to fix the potholes though, uh, because again, uh, that wasn't our right to fix them. Uh, so it was very, it was very difficult. Uh, using other fields. Um, and then, uh, yes, that fiddle, fiddling contest uh, campers field where the soccer fields are at now, which was um, continuously underwater. <laughs> it was uh, basically a little bit of, um, it was lower than the road, the soccer fields, that property. And it would all fill in with water if there was any rainstorm at all. So um, my wife and I, uh, my wife, Kathy and I, both went to um, Essex Council, just giving you a little history here, to, um, to uh, ask Council of the day if we could have that property. And uh, Kathy and I took that on as chairs to have the new soccer fields built back in uh, early 2000s. And uh, through the generosity of the, a lot of the clubs in town and mainly the Optimist Club, that's how those soccer fields came about. I mean, the, the town gave us the land, but uh, that was all fundraising through the community that uh, built those soccer fields. A lot of the, you know, we had five to 600 kids playing soccer at the time, which really helped. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm just agreeing here that if we go back to the days where we're on these uh, little pitches um, in schools, that's, I don't even know if the schools would allow that, but uh, um, I'm, I, I don't know if Kim knows for sure or not these uh, the soccer league in Harrow, I believe is only through the week. They don't play on weekends. So there, there may be an opportunity there, uh, but I know in the past, the McGregor soccer league uh, was only, I think it was Tuesdays and Thursdays or something like that through the week. They, they did not play on Saturdays and Sundays. Uh, what happened was I believe that they started around the same time, um, baseball was going on and uh, they didn't want to conflict with baseball and baseball was on the weekends. So um, might be something to look at. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Malash. Okay, Councillor Bowman, you're the, the last one on this item. Uh, just a quick uh, suggestion. The uh, Sun Parlor School off of Maidstone Avenue, um, there's a, a grounds there that I don't think has been used since the Ravens left town. Um, I believe it's still owned by the school board, but, uh, um, uh, that's probably a, a, so, uh, an area that could be used and it, there is some parking there. So, uh, or at least available on the on neighboring parking lots, it might be uh, an option that could, should be explored. Just a suggestion. Okay, thank you, Councillor Bowman. I'm sure uh, Doug will take that. I don't know, or Doug, do you have an answer for that? No, nope. we'll, okay. we'll add that to all our options. And then just final comment, I know this is only discussion purposes, but so Council is aware, we have put the phase one cost in to the forecast budget for 2022. So something for further discussion. Um, so it is in there, just so Council has what, six more months to think about it. Okay, thank you, Doug. And on that note, I think just a quick, we know council has a ton of needs. We know, I mean, trust me, Jeff and I have had so many discussions, Doug, Lori, Kevin, on how we're trying to get council all of these things that they want, as he noted, Harrow Streetscape, Essex Streetscapes, and have it a, as a sustainable option and, and not put us, uh, expose us in terms of debt. So I guess we're working to be creative and do everything we can in order to get all these wins for council and, and for the community. So uh, okay, on that, um, Heritage Park, uh, Deputy Mayor Malash. Okay. 
you say Heritage Park, Mr. Nepsey? Um, so Heritage Park, uh, this, this is in, um, in Essex. And uh, I believe that, um, that uh, Councillor Guerin probably has a lot more to say on this than what I do. Um, but it's, it's, I think we're looking at timelines on this, uh, how soon we can uh, advance um, development and whether we can, again, it's, it's about sponsorships perhaps, and uh, that's how we bring it forward quicker. Everything, everything that we have on these lists are projects that are going to cost us money. And, and uh, you know, if we can, if we can perhaps um, snag some grants from provincial or federal or, and, and uh, make it a three P partnership um, that would be, that would be ideal. So it's private investment as well as uh, higher levels of government investment along with our tax dollars and, and try and um, see if we can, pull off some kind of magical uh, miracle here to, to try and get these funded. So, but I'm, I'm going to pass it over to Councillor Garen because I think he's got some ideas. I know him and I have discussed some ideas and I'd like him to share some of those ideas. Councillor Garen. Yeah. Thanks Deputy Mayor Malash. Um, through you, Chris. Yes. Yeah, so um, I spoke with Doug about uh, some of the, long-term plans that were originally put in for that heritage park one included an outdoor stage um we, we can call it a pavilion if you'd like but outdoor stage with a roof um i took it upon myself to start to put together a committee uh, i've reached out to a couple of the other stakeholders such as the uh um the associated band and um looking at uh getting the committee together a community driven project uh where we can raise money um I'm in the entertainment industry. My business is in that industry and it, it's taken a, a, a severe beating over the last uh, year with COVID. And there's no clear sign of uh, how we're gonna come out of this yet, but there will be grants coming out from the federal or provincial levels to help support that industry. I, 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 that's what I've been hearing. So I think there's gonna be some opportunity there for a community group to uh, uh, form a committee. I'll spearhead it. Um, and hopefully uh, come up with a, a game plan and uh, uh, in raising the funds needed to, to, to put that in. I believe Doug will speak to this, but I think there's bathrooms that are going in. Is it this next year coming up, Doug? Go ahead, Doug. I wasn't sure if Councilor Guerin was finished yet. Um, to you, Chair. So Shelly, if you don't mind putting up the um, the silo district, it's called the file. So council can see that screen. Thank you. So as like the sports field, Heritage Park redevelopment is part of council's strategic plan and we're continuing to move forward. So this was what was done in August, 2013 from Stemsky. And I think we've done a pretty good job so far on still moving towards that. You can see it's got the uh, working partnership with the BIA, there's a pavilion in there. Um, still got the Spitfire area. But if you kind of look in the bottom right, that's kind of where there's an amphitheater to describe kind of by the home hardware area, um, as Councillor Guerin was talking about. However, what we're looking at now in terms of partnership, I've met with the Essex BIA and the Essex Rotary, and they're both interested in partnering with the town for washrooms. For us, that was kind of our first priority to get washrooms at this park, just because it's has none, it's very limited. So we're looking at putting washrooms and Shelly, maybe you can show on the map, just kind of um, east, oh, map's gone. It was just kind of east of the pavilion. Um, so we're working with them right now. It was something we planned for 2022. They've come back, both BIA and Essex Rotary, mentioning that they have an interest that if this could happen this fall, they would like to see that this fall. So we're working kind of on specs right now and we'll report back to council on that. The next priority that we saw as administration for this park development was power. Similar to Colchester Park around the Essex Arena, if you have events, this park has no power. It just has some standard power by the uh, Spitfire plane and within the pavilion now. So we have in 2022 budget is put in what we call the power stations where you can have different events in the park, which also help for a future amphitheater. And then with that was kind of the last piece of the puzzle here was the amphitheater and as Councillor Garon He's maybe looking at a committee, 
with getting some sponsorships and naming rights, et cetera, to maybe get that moved up quicker. Um, this is a regional park, it's heavily used and we're trying, unfortunately before COVID had a lot of events going there. I know Cynthia and her team have had the kite flying. We've had movie nights, which we're having again coming up. So it's a very popular park. And if our first priority as administration right now is to get those washrooms and hopefully we can have those by the end of this year. Thanks, Doug. Uh, any other questions or comments or follow-ups on that, on the timing or no? Okay. Oh, Councillor Bowman. And just a quick comment. I think the power is, is probably the most important part of anything we do there. Uh, we already have the uh, um, electrical pods that we use for the Fun Fest out in Harrow at the, um, at the park there. They're moved around, but you, you still need something to plug them into. So uh, the major power I issue at uh, Heritage Park will be, uh, you know, what holds it back or lets it move forward. So uh, I think that's uh, hitting the nail on the head, the important part. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Uh, seeing none, then we'll move to our fourth item on the list, Councillor Bondi, uh, sanitary products in the uh, arenas. Thank you. I actually think this was something that came up at council. We were talking about another municipality doing it and our deputy mayor said we should look at doing this. And it's been uh, one of those reports that we as a council gave uh, direction for, and I believe Doug Sweet actually has an update. So I don't know how much we even have to talk about it. That's all. So through you, Mr. Chair, um, as Councillor Bonnie said, this is uh, an item council asset administration come back with a report. The report is finished and actually it's on the April 19th. So the next meeting agenda. Um, just a high level right now. It's for the two facilities, the Essex Arena and the Harrow Complex. Um, it shows the cost. It's not a lot of cost, but there is some cost to it. We worked with our supplier to get those. And it's for a one-year pilot project. Um, the one location, I'll mention that now, it's not on there is ERC. And the reason it's not on there at this time is um, that's overseen by the school board and their custodial. So we have a call into them. If we hear that they're on board, we could add it. But at this time, we're only looking at the ones that we have staff at. For more detail at the re for the report that's this Monday coming up. Good, okay. Uh, thank you, Doug. Thank you, Councillor Bondi. Uh, on to the next one. Um, Councillor Verbeek, you noted uh, the reuse of benches and planters from the streetscape projects. Sure, thanks. Through you, Mr. Chair, uh, just an inquiry. I know I had mentioned it out of the hop to um, Mr. Gerard and uh, to Mr. Sweet that I was hoping we could, uh, I know that there's, you know, the cast offs from Harrow and Essex when they get the new uh, furniture, um, the benches and the planters. I was just hoping we could. Uh, home some of them at Coan Park and at the uh, Essex Gas and Steam and Engine Museum. And I'm just wondering if um, where we're at on that or if they have, um, you know, if they made the, the made the cut in the relo when these are relocated. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so yeah, even before we started with the landscape or the Bow Streetscapes, a discussion we've had internally with infrastructure and own team that any of the benches, any of the furniture that we can reuse in parks, we definitely want to do that to bring some consistency, be it the garbage cans, the benches, etc. Um, so yes, to answer your question, Councilor Rubik, we are looking at doing that. One of the things we do have to look at though is the furniture that's currently in Essex Center. It's been there um, nine going on 10 years, some of it, and it is corroded. So we do have to look at them to make sure they're still okay. The majority, for example, it's happening in Harrow. We're gonna move into parks. Um, we'll add Coant and the gas and steam engine onto our list, kind of areas that need. 
And I'd ask if council know of some other parks or they see in terms of their tour, um, maybe some good locations, please let us know and we'll see where we can disperse these. Councillor Verbeek. Um, no, just just thank you because I don't I certainly don't want these parks to to be overlooked, right? Um, so thank you for that. You're welcome. Any other questions, comments on the reuse of uh, benches and planters from the streetscape? Uh, nope. Okay. Uh, moving on, uh, houseboat rentals. Councillor Verbeek. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I was, uh, you know what, I was just, I was asked to bring it forward again. And I'm glad that, um, I'm sure it's going to be, we're going to visit it when we get the report on short-term rentals. Well, and that isn't that soon. I guess those are two questions. We, before we beat it up today, are we going to be visiting this? We get to the short-term rental review, the report. And um, I just, I just want to say, I'm really, I'm really glad that these are in our sites now. Like, I mean, these were operating and we just, when we say residents, um, emails some of us were like, we have that in our municipality and uh, now that it's come to our attention i'm really really glad that we're going to uh, keep it on our radar and i it certainly sounds like um the owners are are more than willing to address the the issues that the residents have brought to our attention and so will we be discussing this when we get the report because there's no sense in going through it right now Yeah, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, kind of a yes and no answer, unfortunately. So I know um, planning development service has been working on that report. So in terms of short-term rentals, and there will be a common section. I haven't seen the report. I'm not even sure the phase is in, just through some preliminary meetings. Um, and they will address basically short-term rentals on water, what you can and cannot um, enforce. So that will be something coming out of that. In terms of what we currently have at Colchester Harbor, right now they're renting slips and there's nothing stopping them from doing that. Unfortunately, we just have nothing in place. We also have other for-profit industry in our harbor. We do have fishing charters, right? Um, which is a profit on, in town property. So as I sent to council earlier, um, we've enhanced our staff training when they're coming on in terms of the staff that we have from six to 10 on how to address the issues. Our Jay Affleck Harbor, who oversees the harbor, is meeting with the security to enhance what they do um, in terms of that area as well. So we're doing some short-term measures to hopefully address it for this year. But at the end of this year, as a report back to council, I will provide a report on how to move forward with, I'm going to call it profit industry using our harbor. Um, don't know what that answer is at this point, but I think it, maybe it's just a fee increase or maybe there's different regulations, but I think from all this, it's something we're gonna to have to look at and how we want to monitor it moving forward. Um, and then going back to your original question, I know I addressed it. Can't answer if it's gonna be in the report because I don't think, the re I know the report's not done yet, but I do know they're addressing what you can and cannot do with short-term rentals on water. And I'm not sure if Mrs. Chadwick, if I'm wrong, she can jump in, otherwise she's probably good. Thank you everybody and hello. The Yeah, so there is a short-term rental project as you know coming up uh, and the report is still in its review stage because there are a lot of moving parts as it pertains to stakeholders as well as residents. We still need to put that survey out. As it pertains to the marina and the waterfront designation, Technically speaking, the marina has its own special zoning. And so we may find ourselves in a position where because short-term rentals are, we would be treating short-term rentals as a commercial use, as opposed to a residential use. The perspective is that a zoning amendment may not be required. And so some of this, yes, will be rolled into the report, into the study, and certainly into the um, 
survey for the public and for stakeholders. It's something that we're trying to wrap our heads around because it's not land use, it's on water. Uh, but again, we do regulate what happens at the arena. So really it could be up to council in its entirety um, and not so much a zoning amendment in that uh, instance. Um, as far as timing, uh, to, through you, uh, Mr. Chair, to uh, Councillor Verbeek, the timing is that we're looking as targeted, we, we're targeting for May to have everything in place, realizing that there are so many moving pieces, realizing that we need to have that uh, licensing bylaw in place. We will be um, releasing the survey in the next couple of weeks, which therefore pushes the amendments and the licensing bylaw for another I'd say one to two months. So that's, uh, it, it's a little, little delayed, but uh, certainly because there's so many um, pieces involved. Hope that helps. Thank you, Laurie. Councillor Verbeek? No, thank you both. Um, and and Doug. Uh, uh, Mayor Snively. Thank you, uh, through the chair. Um, to uh, Lori or Doug, I, I just want to. I, I want to be careful where we're going here with the charter boats. Um, I, I would not like to see any changes there. I, I can't see where there is a problem with the charter boats. We got to remember one thing: these people coming in, and I'm just talking about the charter boats themselves. They spend money in our municipality. They spend money right there at a restaurant, right close to the marina. Uh, a lot of these people, when they come in and charter a boat, uh, there's a few of them that stay overnight, okay, and they spend money in our community. So we got to be very careful that uh, if we're going to change anything there and make regula uh, tough regulations, because really, I wouldn't want to see the charter business move out of Colchester Harbor, so... Um, I'll leave it at that, and I, I'm just advising that we got to be very careful what we do there. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Councillor Bondi, and then Councillor Bjorkman. Thank you. Just a quick question on the amount of slips we have in the harbor for transient boats. Councillor Bonnie, I don't have that number in front of me, but I do recall that Jay usually has four um, that can be used for transient, but he also, the staff are aware if um, a seasonal slip holder is not using their slip, they'll use it for transient at that time, but usually you'll have four along the edge that he can use for transient, depending on the boat size as well. Councillor Bonnie, is that sufficient? Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Bjorkman. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, through you. Um, okay, so I understand the report's not gonna come for a while, but we're gonna start having people at the harbor very soon and staying in houseboats. So what are the steps that we're taking right now that are going to uh, kind of watch out for our residents? Uh, we know what the complaints have been, uh, the loud noise, the parties, the drinking, um, stuff on the docks. So is there, is there some direction that we're giving to our staff down at the harbor? Um, that if somebody, you know, from the town comes forward or they notice this, uh, any rowdy behavior or things like that going, what, what is the direction we're giving to our staff and any steps that they should take? Hey, Mr. Chair. Um, yes, a couple of steps we've taken is, one, we met with the owner of the boat right off the bat and kind of set expectations there. And we got contact information. We had a copy of the waiver and agreement that he uses for his rentals. So... Um, we met with them on that and really stressed the expectations because of the complaints that are coming. Our staff have always been trained on how to kind of deal with rowdiness because it's not only been in the past, uh, these houseboats, it's been some of the seasonal at times too. Um, but we've enhanced that this year. So they're more trained, there will be more trained, um, how to approach these people, what to look for. Again, it's an expectation, right? If you're going to be down there, there's an expectation. And we're really trying to stress that and for them to be consistent from shift to shift. To add that, they're only there to 10 p.m. So Jay is also going to be meeting with the uh, security company to let them know expectations because sometimes these issues aren't going to happen from 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. It's going to be after 10. 
So we need them to file the report, who they contact, the dope or whoever it may be, but that they cannot ignore it, they have to address it either. Because one of the things for us as administration is, we only had one formal complaint last year. And it's hard to address and move forward and get better unless we hear about those things. So that's the other thing, not only our staff, but security, you gotta document everything that's happening. With documentation, it gives us more teeth to do something in the future. Um, that's kind of the steps we're taking now. We thought a lot is trying to be proactive Again, meeting with the user groups, enhancing staff and security training. And Jay and myself met with a couple of residents that have concerns also and let them know what we're looking at doing too. So we're trying to be a, a good neighbor, being proactive as our first steps. But if those don't go, we'll have to see if there be other, I don't know, more restrictive um, requirements that may occur. Okay, uh, thank you for more. Um, yeah, we've, uh, you know, obviously a couple of us, uh, Councillor Bond and I met with a, with a couple of residents that were down there and heard those concerns. And uh, that is good to know, you know, that, that you've been in contact with them. And we appreciate that, uh, that they are hearing there's this conversation between the groups uh, so that hopefully we can head those uh, kinds of things off. One of the other things I was wondering was the, uh, the owner uh, of the rental Boats. Is he, uh, are they, he willing to share some contact information with those residents? So, you know, uh, they know they've been instructed that they need to make formal complaints so that we can build a file. And if something continues on, but if they can work it out themselves, all the better, uh, especially since he uh, made it known that he, there is somebody that's only five minutes away that he, uh, has given the job of keeping an eye on those boats too. Councillor Bjorkman, I will ask that question because that was, you're correct. He did mention that he does have um, a manager that's close by to address issues that our staff will have. And I'll see if he's willing to have that publicly also, that number. Okay, thank you very much. Any other uh, questions? Comments? No, I don't see any uh, raised hands. So, okay. Uh, so on to the next one, uh, future, future capital projects. I know we touched on a little bit uh, with respect to the soccer fields, but uh, future capital projects and where they fit into our long-term. Deputy Mayor Malash. Chris, I don't have that list in front of me right now uh, of the projects that I sent to you. I don't have that email in front of me. I had broken it down into several items. Uh, I don't have that either, uh, Deputy Mayor. I can okay. try and hunt, hunt for it if you want to. If you want to push it down down the yeah. list, I can, I can. Yeah, go to the next item, and I'll I'll pull up the uh, on my phone. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, Councillor Bondi, then the Harbor Divestiture. No, oh, thank you. Um, I think it's been something that we've always had on our list. And we always say, you know, we've done environmental assessments, we've done business cases, and it's always kind of lingered there. So I'd like to like, have the discussion so we can say whether we're going forward with it, which I don't think we should, because we get a lot of grants from the federal government. And I don't really think the federal government is uh, in a position to, to give us money to get it up to snuff anyways. But I kind of just want to have the conversation so we can see what everybody's thoughts are so we can put it to bed or get a game plan because it's one of those items that is hung there for the past 10 years. Like we had a committee and then we dissolved the committee and every once in a while I get the question of what's going on with the Harbor divestiture and I'm like, I don't know. So I don't want to have the, I don't know anymore. Somebody give me an answer, please. Director Sweet. So maybe I can give some facts and then council can kind of have their debate from those facts. Um, as Councillor Bonnie mentioned, it's been discussed many times. We've been working with the Department of Fisheries and Oceans on this. They would actually divest that harbor to the town of Essex today, no problem for a dollar. Problem is as a town, we want to have repairs done before we would take ownership of it. And in 2016, um, council had us, we had Landmark Engineering was commissioned. They did a condition assessment and to have the work done, it was approximately 5.2 million in 2016. 
out of that 5.2 million, over 4 million was just for break wall repairs. We've also then had Stantec to do a marine environmental assessment, which is the next step if you want to divest. And then we had further discussions with DFO. And basically the comment back is, and they've been pretty consistent with this, they have $2 million annually in their budget for all of Canada. As a town, we're asking them to give us 5.2 million. That's where this struggle has been in the past. So um, those are kind of the facts. So council aware 2016 is 5.2 million for repairs. Um, if you want, and I agree with Councillor Bondi, as it is right now, we get constant grants from the DFO if we need to do dredging, new docks, et cetera. So if we had ownership, those would be 100% on the tax base. Okay, uh, Mayor Snively. Uh, to the chair, um, uh, just to extend what uh, Doug just said, I, uh, Deputy Mayor uh, Malash and myself, we did meet I believe uh, back then Deputy Mayor was with Watson at the time. You remember we asked him for money, if he could uh, fight for some money for, for the harbor. And at that time, I think we asked for $5 million back then, wasn't it? Deputy Mayor, I think it was $5 million. And that was, so oh boy, that was in 2002, I believe it was, or, or later than that, wasn't it, uh, Deputy Mayor, if you recall? But we did sit down with him and... Uh, to see if we can get money there. And same thing, we, we're willing to take it over for a dollar as long as they give us the money to upgrade and then they had no expense after that. But I don't see you're gonna see any money come down from the federal government on that. Um, the, the money is just uh, dried up. So uh, if you wanted to add anything to that, Deputy Mayor, on our discussion, go ahead. Yes, one of, one of the things that uh, we'd always looked at when we talked about divestiture was the need for the federal government to put some more money into the break wall. Uh, the current position of the break wall uh, needs to extend in a different direction. Uh, there needs to be another break wall that stops the sand from coming into the harbor. And uh, that's the reason why we always have to have it uh, continuously dredged. Um, you know, almost every year we have to have it dredged and there's a, a big expense there, but, uh, even the waters, the way the waters, when there's a storm that flow into the, uh, the harbor, um, because of the way the break wall has been built, um, leads us to believe that uh, it has to be changed. And that was one of the big issues uh, that we were trying to negotiate with the federal government back from the first time that I was on council in 2003. And there's been several councillors that have led that divestiture. We've had several committees that have worked with um, various uh, members of the provincial government uh, to try and um, make this happen. We've had uh, councillors who have actually uh, made a trip up to Ottawa to have a meeting um, to try and, and make this happen. So uh, it's been a long time coming if it happens. Uh, but again, I, maybe Mr. Sweet can um, comment on the break wall portion of the uh, of the harbor, whether that's still a concern or not. You're definitely mayor, you're 100% correct. That is the main issue is um, we'd want the break wall reconfigured. And that was part of um, Landmark Engineering's, they provided, provided design, we presented the council, council supported it, but it was 4.1 million just to do those break wall repairs. And it is still an issue, you are correct. Um, and that is still the issue in terms of the most cost. Uh, Doug, just a question on, on my end. When were the when did Landmark provide before I go to Councillor Baum? Uh, 2016, they did their report. Yeah, so if you guys think of all construction prices and what they've done, I mean, how lumbers, you know, you get 10, 12 bucks for a two by four now, which was three bucks in 2016, that's done to that price. So uh, I am sure it hasn't gone down. Uh, Councillor Bowman. Nothing? Councilor Vanderdon. Yes, Mr. <clears throat> yes, Mr. Nepsey, thanks. Through you, um, I almost hate to bring up something that's a fantasy on the fantasy wish list, but every time I've mentioned this to people, they love the idea, so I, we have to bring it up now. Um, every, I just love wharves and piers and docks of all kind, and every time I'm on that one, I think, gee, wouldn't it be great if this was two or three times longer? 
you know, I, I, I know we can't afford it, but I'm just saying maybe we should, maybe we should uh, think about that. Uh, think about making it happen. I, I've been told that, uh, that uh, DFO wouldn't permit a uh, solid, uh, solid filled in pier anymore because of what it does to, uh, to currents. But, uh, you know, we happen to have a world-class leading tube maker in town. We could, we could suspend the whole thing on, uh, on, on piers just like they do in England. And in England, they make them a mile long on poles. So uh, anyway, I just think that um, that would be certainly aspirational because we couldn't tackle it until we, we deal with the rest of it. But I just want it on the record as something that uh, a lot of people I've heard say they would like. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Vanderdon. Uh, Doug, did you have any, um, I guess, recollection of comment on the, the nature of the potential dock, the future of it having to be open or solid? No, but we did inquire with, uh, with Landmark if you could actually have um, not, not solid so you could have more water flow so it wasn't stagnant within the harbor. And I know it came back, we wouldn't, um, they wouldn't allow it. In terms of the pier, we did have a design from Landmark to actually make it an L-shaped pier. So not only at the end, but coming back. Um, I think that was an extra three or $4 million, but it was part of their plan to look at as well. Thumbs up. Uh, Councilor Bonnie, do you have anything to add to that topic? Or are you looking for driving more discussion from your fellow councilors? So I think right now it's fair to say we're not taking an aggressive approach on divestiture. Is that fair to say? I see a few thumbs up and some heads shaking. So I think okay. that's fair to say. <laughs> okay. All right. And then I will just uh, revert anybody that has questions back to this meeting to watch it. <laughs> so sure. it's good. Okay. Thanks. Yep. You're welcome. Okay. Um, moving down the list. The next item, Councillor Garen, tables and chairs provided in rental of high school auditoriums, although that hasn't happened in a, a year and a bit, but uh, it, the floor is yours. Thanks, Chris, through you. Yeah, I've had discussions with uh, Doug in the past, but I put on quite a few events there, and I know there may be some appetite for other events there, but one of the big challenges is tables and chairs, and it's very expensive to rent them and bring them in. Um, we have a storage problem down there at the high school as well, even if we had tables and chairs where we put them. But it is something I think uh, we should continue to, uh, to seek, whether it's um, hopefully we have events there again soon. But uh, there's always a need for, for the tables and chairs. And like I say, when, when I do an event there, I'm paying anywhere between $700 and $900 just to bring in tables and chairs for an event there. So it's, it's quite a bit of expense. Uh, many of the venues will have them and, 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 and they're part and parcel of the rent and, and some charge you for tables and chairs. I know when I do my events up at Western Fair, uh, we pay for every chair, we pay for every uh, table, but it's a lot less than it would be to bring in an outside party rental place to bring them in. Not that I'm not trying to take business away from anyone that's in that industry, but it, it would be nice to have some tables and chairs up there among a few other things that, that could be used up there. And I'm sure that uh, with the, I'm not sure actually, to be honest with you, Doug could maybe answer this, but you know, if, if there was an investment in tables and chairs, uh, would we be in on that alone or would that be something this, the school would also be um, partnering on us with? Thanks. Before I go to Doug, just to clarify, are you looking for the, for them to be housed at the high school or would it be something or back and forth or have you? Well, right you know, now, what we, sorry, Chris, right now, when there's an event down there, the town has been gracious enough to, to let, my events use tables and chairs if they're available from, but then it's a matter of the user um, going to pick the chairs up and bring them down there. And even though that's, that's great, um, it's, it takes a toll on the tables and chairs. So you move them around, the more you move them around, the more the, uh, the, 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 the less life they'll have versus if they were just in one place. So um, yeah, at times that, like I say, the town has, has said, yeah, we've got 10 tables and, hundred chairs over at the arena, come pick them up, drop them off. And uh, that's, that, that's fine. But the events I'm talking about down at the high school would need more like 40 tables and 400 chairs, so to speak. So, yeah. Okay. Thanks, uh, Doug. Yep. Three, Mr. Chair. 
So um, just to go to Councilor Gear on one thing, it's not, hasn't just been your events. We've done that with all events, be it the OPP, the fire, other events there. If we have tables and chairs available at the Shaheen room, um, sometimes in McGregor, we, we work with them there. Um, in terms of the restaurant question, I'll defer to actually Cynthia, because I know she's been working with the school board with different options that are there or not there. Um, so I'll just defer that one maybe to Cynthia. Um, yeah, storage is our issue. Um, safe storage access. So we've actually had a couple of different contractors in and looking at our storage options and we, for the cost involved and for the uh, amount at this point, we just can't rationalize um, doing the engineering changes to that understage storage that we would need for it to be safe. Um, in terms of the cost or the payment, um, it, yes, the school board would essentially end up um, contributing to half the cost based under the operational costs of the, the building. Um, so that that's not it. It's still everything that we've looked at so far came back with a pretty hefty price tag on top of the materials themselves. So storage number one, and then access uh, into those areas. Aaron, and then Deputy Mermelage. Yeah, so just to add to Cynthia's comments. So um, I, I, I guess we, we'd, be, we'd really have to be looking at adding on to the building in some, in some way of being able to, because uh, we wouldn't want to put those sea cans out there. I see there's two of them out there right now at the high school. I'm not sure what they're storing in them, but I don't envision a sea can as being someone we want to keep good tables and chairs in. Um, so really we, we'd be looking at it with probably having to either add on or a, put, a, put another facility, storage facility somewhere on the ground. Is that what we're, we're talking if we were to do this? Um, uh, yeah, and I, that would be something outside of the, the, the existing walls that we have right now. Uh, at that point, going out even onto the grounds and doing any adjustment on the grounds or the property, we don't have the ability to do that under the partnership. So, um, yeah, I think, I think it puts up another bit of a roadblock to have an external storage area um, that's not a permanent part of the building. Deputy Mayor Malosh, and then I'll come back. Thank you, Chris, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, so I think it's a great idea. I, I totally agree with it. And by renting, like even if it's a minimal amount of rent on the tables and chairs, uh, you'll end up paying back all the cost. And uh, maybe at some point in time, once we get the cost back on them, then we collect money to start replacing them. Um, so I think it's a great idea. Uh, isn't there a way maybe that we could negotiate with the school? There must be some kind of storage that we could maybe do indoors that would be more convenient because if you start going outside of the building in the winter time, the rain, uh, there's gotta be a spot inside the school that there'd be uh, in that area that we could somehow weasel uh, storage area. Um, that would be my hope. Um, and Mr. Chair, um, I'm ready with my list for projects if you want to come back to me after this. I do want to come back to you, but we'll, uh, we'll, come, we'll come back after this. Uh, I had uh, Councillor Verbeek, then Councillor Bjorkman, and then, uh, um, and then, sorry, Joe, we'll go back to you after that. Oh, thanks, Mr. Chair. Through you, I just, I'm, look, I'm seeking clarity. So right now we're jumping ahead and we're, we're looking at places to um, store either sea cans or some kind of addition or something on the high school property to store new tables and chairs that we're going to purchase. And now my, now for the clarity, is this so we as a town have tables and chairs to rent out to user groups when they run fundraisers? Is that, or like, I'm not, I'm, I'm not hundred percent clear on. Correct. Director Sweet, yeah. Hey, Mr. Chair. So for some clarification, I'll use comparison. If someone rents the Shaheen room right now at the Essex Center Sports Complex, tables and chairs come with a rental. They're in the room, our staff pull it out in that. If someone rents this gym to put on an event, anything at the Essex Rec Complex, um, we, we're very limited on tables and chairs there. So now they have to pay an additional cost as a user group to rent tables and chairs to be delivered and dropped off. Um, 
So with that, the question is, is there storage? You know, Deputy Mayor has said, is there spaces? We've, we've taken almost every space we can for our storage. And once Jim B became another space, it's very, very limited there. The option that Cynthia was talking about, we've looked about under the stage, but because of health and safety, the school board and also the engineer to be able to put uh, the weight of tables and chairs underneath has been the issue. Thanks, Doug. And I guess just a little insight on our end. I know if this was an item that was either requested of council through budget process or a budget item uh, from the managers uh, upwards to the directors, there would be some type of cost analysis. And I know um, Manager Cakebreg noted that, you know, it's an assessment of how many times are we asked for them? How many times are we renting them out? How much are we paying? How much could we rent them back for? Is it a worthwhile, worthwhile business investment? Is it a worthwhile community investment? And those are the things that we would weigh, um, you know, internally before we brought it back to council, you know, in terms of, yes, there's fiscal decisions and there's political decisions and community decisions. And we, that ultimately falls to council. But we would give you that rounded picture to say, oh, it doesn't make sense, but we really want it. Or it makes sense. Yes, we can pay it back in five years, there's a high need for it. So uh, just some insight, I guess, on, on what happens on uh, administrations and that way. Uh, Councillor Bjorkman, and then back to Councillor Garen. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And just, just quickly, I just wanted to answer, um, after working with the sports teams there for about 10 years, there is not another square inch of storage. Uh, if you want to buy tables and try to put them inside that building, forget it. Um, those racks that we kept the chairs underneath the stage, um, there's, there's all that room, but they're not treated well. So to, uh, Ms. Cakebread's, uh, point, you know, to put things away safely and to make sure that they're treated properly. Um, yeah, I just don't, uh, I can't see if we got these things where we keep them because you'd have to build a space to keep them, which is never going to be, uh, financially viable. So I think until there's actually, you know, the, the school, Anybody there says, no, we could, if you bought these things, we could keep them on site and here's where, that we really don't need to proceed further with a, a cost analysis of this. Thanks. Back to you, Councillor Garen. Yeah, thank you through you. Yeah, so I guess with the storage space on site being the major problem um, and the fact that the tables and chairs that we have now that are existing are really meant for the use at the at the community halls that they're in right now. So I guess the only thing else to maybe do would would there be an area um, elsewhere where they can be new ones could be stored, maybe not to the um, quality that we're using in the Shaheen room, just a, the typical fold up chairs that you see at the uh, you know in front of the stage when we do the fun fest. Um, we would be able to use them for for the festival for other all kinds of different things that we do. Uh, and I know, I think right now, there is an option that, to have the town staff bring tables and chairs and pay for it if the user groups don't want to do it. But maybe if we had them and that was part of the deal where you had to deal with the staff to deliver them and to pick them up, they would take probably better care of them than maybe the user groups might. Um, there might and, and then you charge for it. At least it's an option because I, I can, if you're not savvy enough to source that kind of stuff for yourself, it just might be the one thing where a potential renter says, you know what, there's just too much for us to go through to do an event here. By the time we do the rent, get the insurance, bring in the tables, bring in the chairs. But if we got solutions for them, like we do with our insurance, we offer that now to groups. We say, if you can't get your own insurance, we, we, you can go through us and get insurance. Same thing in tables and chairs. You can't get tables and chairs, we can get them for you. We can deliver it here for you. And that takes a lot of stress off the groups. So I say, keep it on the radar and let's just look at other means of doing it rather than using on-site storage. Thanks. Okay. Uh, any other comments on uh, chairs? It's it's always fascinating to me. I guess just some insight on mine. Th that was the one item I never thought would have taken that much time, but it's it's yeah, it, it's it's great to see where council's um, interest in, in direction go. So that's that's uh, another benefit to having this night. So that's uh, great. Uh, okay, on, on next, um, uh, plastic span, Councillor Bonnie. Thank you, Chris. I believe this uh, came up in, in council and there was a teacher with a couple young students that 
came to our council and I believe Councillor Bjorkman made the motion. Oh uh, gosh, 2019. I don't, I didn't get my book out. And I'm just, uh, we decided to talk about what we could do in our facilities for a plastics ban. So just wanting to uh, have that discussion. And it's, I mean, it's been COVID. So really everything's been banned in our facilities for a year, but I do, <laughs> yeah. Um, I do know that uh, the shop, you know, the snack shop in the Hero Arena did use um, like biodegradable straws, but just wondering if there's appetite with council and administration for a policy or an education around uh, town town facilities, I guess. We'll got to start somewhere. First off, I just want to apologize, Deputy Mayor Malash. I was supposed to go back to your list. We'll definitely get that one. That, get that one next. So I, I apologize for that. So uh, Councillor Bonnie is looking for, uh, I'll, go, I'll go to Doug, but she's looking for uh, Councillor. So Doug first. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So Councillor Bonnie is correct. Uh, when that came out, we met immediately with our two uh, users of the concessions. Um, if they could get rid of plastic straws, um, they're both um, willing to look at doing that. And then as Councillor Bonnie said, COVID had uh, came up. We've also added that when those leases expire and we go to retender them. We are looking at putting in a clause regarding that, that's highly recommended that they use. Unless council gives us a direction and the policies in place, then it could be mandatory that they must um, not use plastic straws, for example. Any other discussion? I, I think, uh, uh, Councilor Verbeek. Hi, thanks through you, Mr. Chair. Um, when we have those um, discussions with, uh, at, at the beginning of the lease time, Doug, can we also push for styrofoam free as well? I know a lot of facilities have left styrofoam behind because they recognize how harmful it is on the environment as well. And there's a lot of alternatives. Um, maybe uh, include that in the conversation when we're... Uh, you know, processing these leases. Hey, Mr. Chair, one thing I'd be looking for is some direction from council. Um, there is basically inquiry regarding plastics, but until we have a formal policy ban, it's hard to imp implement because it's also a cost to these, these um, um, operators, correct? So um, we also, as administration, need some help on where council and what, where they want to take this and how far they want to take it. Anybody want to add more? No? Nothing? Okay. Uh, I guess even on our end, I guess, I mean, you know, you've heard it both from uh, Councillor Bonnie Verbeek and, and Doug as well, like the direction, uh, the direction we require from council, whether that's a notice of motion or whether that's, you know, brought forward strongly, that's, that's the position of council with a lot of these things is Make those make those notices and get that support of council or not, right? And, and that's why I think some of these things um, get left, I guess, hanging around, waiting for either direction or not direction. And I can appreciate, you know, we're trying to figure that out, everybody, one way or another, right? So um, if anyone has, or you know, I guess keep that in mind. If that's something that's you want to push, push, right? Push forward and and bring it forward, and and we'll make it happen, right? So. Um, Okay, on to the next one, uh, beach security. Deputy oh, Mayor. Oh, no, sorry. again, Richard, sorry. See, I, I just, again, thank you. Everybody just jumped on me in the room here. So um, <laughs> Deputy Mayor Malash, Capital Projects, Capital Projects. Thank, thank you. I, I would have been fine with if you had moved on to something else. So we, we always can come back. Um, under those future projects that I had mentioned, uh, a couple of, I've got 10 items here. Some of them uh, may have been talked about uh, by other uh, councillors as, as projects. Uh, number one was an upgrade in soccer fields at Coan Park. And I'm not sure, uh, Mr. Sweet, Director Sweet, if this is already on uh, a future uh, budget line for parks and um, culture and rec. So Deputy uh, Mayor Malash, I'm going to, I'm just going to interrupt here. Um, because we do have that, those items that you provided in the recent email are on the list. 
the original statement in terms of capital projects was a generic statement that you provided back in the list. It was just a generic statement about capital projects and a discussion on where they fit. If you're okay to, to uh, keep with the identified capital projects you have, they come next after beach security. So I, I do have them here. You have soccer fields, okay. splash pads, picnic tables, fire yep. station. Okay, okay, so that's just that's, just to that keep was, okay. that's what you're talking about. Okay, so let's yep. if we can keep just to the integrity of the list, then uh, Doug, we're going to wait on this and we'll go to beach security first, Councillor Bondi, and then your items are are all next on that list, uh, Deputy Mayor Malaj. Okay, so thank Councillor Bondi. Thank you through you, Chris. That is a that is an old item now, taken care of. So we could go to the next one. Oh, oh I uh, see. Councillor Bjorkman has his hand up. Yep, he does. So, Councillor Bjorkman, if you want to add to that, go ahead. Yes, thank you. Um, just just back to the the beach. You know, we had an issue when we had our issue last year um, regarding beach security and just you know things that happened at the beach. Um, one of our bigger problems was we opened up our facilities without washroom facilities. We allowed people to come down and use the park and use the beach. So we're back into this, this lockdown stay at home order. Now we're probably going to come out of it in red because that's the color we went into it with. And I want to just make sure that we don't open anything. We don't allow anyone in the beach, uh, the Harbor, the, any of that stuff without washrooms being open. And uh, obviously security is gonna start the end of June. So is there a way that, uh, that we can, you know, just talk about what we think should be allowed uh, as far as when security starts, we'll probably have people on the beach before security. Are we going to open the washrooms um, depending on where we land with our COVID uh, protocols and the colors? Uh, as I think that was the probably the biggest problem last year that led to the most issues was not having those washroom facilities open when we opened up um, splash, splash pad and allowed the people at the beach. I just wonder if there's a, a plan for that for this year. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Right now, you're correct. It all depends on what uh, color zone we're in at the time. But if we're able to open our plan would be as in the past where I'm going to use splash pads open after open the long weekend in May. And that's kind of when all the washrooms and everything are ready. If we can get them ready prior to that, we will. And if the color allows us to, we will. Um, but I agree with you. If we're, for example, in a current lockdown red, um, well, those would have to still be closed. And I think we'd have communication with council just to make sure everybody's on the same page with these clothes. We are either not opening or opening modified somehow. But right now it's um, the long weekend in May when washrooms, splash pads, all that are back open to public depending on the COVID restrictions. So Doug, just a, a quick question on my end. Thank you for that. So in there, they would be closed in lockdown. Would they be closed in red as we know it now? I haven't looked at it in a while. Last time red was closed for outdoor washrooms. Um, for example, arenas, when they could be open, the washrooms and showers and that cannot be used. So I believe it was orange was the first time we were allowed to open washrooms outside, but I would have to verify that. I think, uh, it, I mean, just Doug and I um, touched on this briefly, but it would be constant communication with council as he noted. We would be assessing what we're able to do, what we're, what our our community partners are doing, because we know that influences, um, you know, well they're doing it. How come we're not doing it? Uh, and we would, I mean, always ensuring we're following the guidelines uh, and communicate that to council and to uh, look for direction if if they want more or, or less, um, and, and go from there. Council Bjorkman. Okay. Yeah, and that's that's great. Those are the conversations needed but i just think it's so important that whatever we do whatever we decide to open and invite the public to or allow the public we have to have washrooms and if we don't have washrooms then we restrict access uh to whatever it is because it, it just it goes hand in hand and the problems that we had uh really followed along that line so 
I just really want to make sure that we're, we're heightened awareness of that. And we're, we're thinking of that washroom for, you know, everybody who takes, takes the long ride out to Colchester and wants to walk down the beach. Now they got to ride back to wherever they came from and they're looking for a bathroom. Um, that was a problem last year. Thank you. Councillor Bjorkman, I think, I think that's a, definitely a fair statement. You know, we do have, we have lots of parks that don't have washrooms. Um, and I know this is, is different than that in terms of uh, town space. And, and I think we'll have to view it. We'll view it that way and, and make sure council's on the same page uh, or we're on the same page as council. And, and I think learning what we learned last year, we, we really figured out a good way to promote, communicate, and, and, you know, do what we have to do to uh, ensure everybody's safe and, um, you know, it's safe down there as well. Uh, anybody else on, um, on the beach security? No. Okay. So moving on to uh, Deputy Mary Malosh, these are your, you know, the list. I think the first one I have on the list is the better soccer fields at Coan Park. Correct. And I already talked briefly about that, but I was going to ask uh, Director Sweet if that was already part of a budget item. Not in the current forecast. A lot of um, an item like that, we rely on what comes from the operating committee itself. Um, I know the splash pad, your next one, is currently on the council wish list, I would say. Um, I don't recall soccer fields being brought forward. Okay. I know when I was on the Coan Park, uh, Previous to Councillor Verbeek, uh, that was always a concern. They uh, would like to have seen upgraded um, soccer fields. And that may mean upgraded as to the, their current position where they're at, or furthering the park on the other side of the gas and steam engine and leasing maybe for 20 years a piece of property or buying a piece of property. And I know, I know we've looked into that. Uh, I've looked into that with you, uh, Mr. Sweet. And uh, that was an expensive alternative to uh, to go that route, but uh, perhaps just an upgrade of the facility that we have right now at the uh, at the Coan Park. Um, we'll, just to add that, I can actually have since Jake's on the call, he can probably reach out to Joanne the committee to see what upgrades they're thinking of, and we can work with Amosburg as well. Okay, thank you. For costing, Councillor Verbeek. My thank you, um, um, and uh, thank you, Deputy Mayor, um, for bringing these forward. I imagine prior to um, <laughs> that you were experiencing some of the frustrations I am for a long time. I think there was there was comments made a couple of times by another councillor about you know Cohen. It seems so greedy asking all these things, but these these things have been on the wish list forever and ever, and they just roll over and keep coming back and not coming to fruition, right? So for instance, well, like right now, specifically the, the, the soccer fields, if just the ones that are present need some dirt and some work on the slopes. Um, but yeah, they, they feel there is a little bit of space for some more needed uh, um, soccer fields. So I'm getting often now at the, uh, from the committee, I've been emailing or messaging back and forth right now with um, Tina and Joanne. They're they're again asking like what what is our vision for the park because we you know we we recognize the need for some of these things, and then um, and then we have to go and get Amherstburg to be um, you know in, to 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 match to match our our um, our commitment right, and and that's a big challenge. Now we have this community with over two thousand, well over two thousand of our residents, and they're like, we need. A, how come you know the other three wards? They have the the, the splash pad. We really they've been asking for years. We could use a running track. We have nowhere and nothing for our kids to do. Why can't we have a better park? I love the top park over by the community center, but they're they're really. I mean, all of our other towns, uh, our parts of the municipality have all kinds of parks. Numerous pounds, too many to count. We have the tar top park and it's beautiful. I'm not gonna take from that. And so uh, the question keeps coming up, like, do we have a vision? Do we have to have a hard conversation as a council about this? 
yeah, I think the time has come for that. And I really appreciate the deputy mayor bringing these items forward again and again, because I know that he has in the past relentlessly for the community of McGregor. And I I get tons of emails. And when I do was able to get out in the community and be on doorsteps and talk to people, I heard over and over, why does, why does Colchester and Harrow and Essex have splash pads? What about our kids? And they are a community of well over 2,000 people. The end, like, why don't, why are they the only center that doesn't have a skate park or a pirate ship or a splash pad? Um, so I, I know, Doug, it, it's because we're part owners with, with Amherstburg, but it's also our gem. It really is. We have to try and we have to start looking at ways to, to rectify this because I, if I've been hearing since before I got on that it, it, it is an issue and it needs to be addressed. And we just keep saying, well, we could do that for you, but, uh, and our residents of that area, but it's up to Amherstburg to cough up the other half. So we have to start looking at other solutions, right? I'm hoping we can. Doug, I know you're gonna respond. Can you give a little bit of history about Coan as well? And I'll like give maybe, you, but I'm sure there's someone on here who has more history, but uh, prior to amalgamation, um, it's, own, it's owned by more than one municipality, and that kind of answers Councillor Verbeek's thing. It was either it was Colchester North and Anderton, even pre-amalgamation, hence the name Coan. Um, and that's just all I wanted to kind of add in terms of the comment is we can only control what we can control for a town of Essex. We can put a dog park, we can put a splash pad, we can put things in these other wards because they're on town property that we have control over. Right now, how the model and how the agreement is with Coan Park it is, it's 50% town of Essex, 50% town of Amherstburg. And unfortunately, the two municipalities have different vision of, of that park. So I do agree um, for town of Essex, we probably need to have a conversation how we wanna move forward. But right now that is a barrier and a challenge we have in terms of two different visions on 50% ownership of the park. Councilor Verbeek. <clears throat> so just while we're there because this has certainly come up uh director sweet i i just i hate to turn away from coan park because it is a it is a gem and we need to look at how to how to rectify this because i've been hearing about that that it is a challenge right it, there is room there's uh, lots of opportunity to do things with that park and and because of co-ownership it's a struggle so my next question is uh, um, is there anywhere else within that area that we can put some of these um, anemones in for the people of the area? Uh, you know, I keep hearing about, I mean, um, um, you know, that skate parks and splash pads and things like that and the very lack of things for young people. And I like, I mean, I, the library and that top park are great, but we need, and thank you, uh, Director Chadwick has has let us know that we have a lot of new housing coming in. We could be we could be seeing in the next two years hundreds of new families in in McGregor. Thank you, Mr. Chair, so I think to answer your question, Councilor Verbeek and uh, Director Chadwick can jump on if I'm missing something here. But the issue is what property the town owns. Very limited property we currently own in McGregor proper. So I think if you're looking at expanding amenities, um, the town would have to look at purchasing some property for green space oh. activities. And that's kind of what Mayor Malash was uh, referring to previously. We tried to talk with the owner of the farm adjacent to Coam Park and it was uh, extremely expensive. But we have looked at options, but there may be other areas within the boundaries as well. Is, is the area behind uh, the community center, is that, Town owned, um, where I, I, which is close to where I believe the these apartment buildings are, are planned. No. Is Councilor is that town not, owned at all? No, it's not. No. no. Uh, uh, Councilor Graham, before I go to you, I, I think also, I mean, the deputy mayor has brought this ties into the sewage, the partnership with Amherstburg on, um, you know, it's their sewage system that our residents buy into, and I don't know if councillors prior to me or at some time have you ever had a joint meeting with their 
council to have a visioning session on McGregor. You have had that, right? So I'm going to go to Councillor Garen first, and then maybe Deputy Mayor Malosh, you could talk about how that went. I don't know if you think it's worthwhile to potentially do again, and we can maybe tackle more than one topic uh, as far as McGregor goes. Councillor Garen? Thanks, Chris. Yeah, through you. That's exactly what I was going to be asking about. Um, Doug said that we share different uh, um, visions for that park. I'd like to know what their vision is. And if our council has bigger visions than them, and they seem, and, and, and the partnership seems to be something that we feel isn't working for us or impedes the pathway to our vision, then maybe it's time that we sit down and discuss what we want to do with this park. And maybe we want to take this park on ourselves. I look at the budget, how much money we put into it in a year and how much they put into a year. And we're not looking at a considerable amount of money, I don't think. So yeah, if our visions don't align or if the town of Amherstburg doesn't want to be a part of this and our council feels that, you know, it, we see bigger things for it then we should be looking at this. Deputy Mayor Malage. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I think, I think one of the things that we've always thought of, and I think we need to go back to Amherstburg Council and have a session with them on a lot of issues. There's, um, you know, and, and I know other councillors have brought up the issue of uh, Smith Side Road as well. Uh, you know, deplorable that uh, state that it was in at one point in time. And I think the one, the Amherstburg side of the road has still not been taken care of as far as I know. So, uh, I think there's a number of issues that we need to talk about and try and get an agreement, to, you know, get things rolling. Um, the last time that we had a, a, a get together with Amherstburg council, not anyone that's on council right now was on council because uh, it was three terms ago and uh, mayor uh, DiCarlo and uh, deputy mayor Malosh have only been on for two terms and everybody else that's on council, this is their first term. They had a total turnaround this last time. So uh, I think it's wise to have a, a meeting with them just to go over all of these issues. Um, I think that you probably would get some good vibes out of it because uh, it just makes sense that we share the cost of this park because it really does serve a good number of residents from Amherstburg. And perhaps if they're not interested in serving those residents uh, that are in McGregor, maybe we suggest to them that uh, Essex would be willing to take those residents on and, and take charge of the park and, you know, continue to let their residents use the library uh, community center that we, that we constructed at our cost. Um, I think we should be looking at the sewage system there. At one point in time, it was, uh, a shared joint venture between the two. Now, all of the monies that are paid into the reserves there are used all over the town of Amherstburg. And the rates for the residents in McGregor skyrocketed when they did that, um, at least doubled. And our Essex residents complained, but there was nothing that we could do because we don't have any say in the sewage system there. We're at their mercy. So there's a number of issues I think that we need to discuss. And uh, I think uh, a round table with the town of Amherstburg might be a really plausible way to, to go to try and get some results. So looking forward to that. So is that then, uh, Rob, direction? We can take direction out of this? So I, is, that, I, is that you want to make that direction, Deputy Mayor Malosh, that yeah, we, held, we look to hold a joint meeting? Yes, please. And then do I need, for direction, do I need a seconder? Thank you, Deputy. We would just take it as a recommendation, and then when we go into formal council again, we would pass that as a motion or a resolution for direction at that point. Okay, so we'll, um, I'm seeing heads nodding. We'll take that at direction, and then council can can choose to to uh, pass it or not. Um, Mayor Snively? Uh, thank you, through the chair. To Deputy Mayor Malaj, she's 100% right there. Uh, I think with the, with the mayor and the deputy mayor that they have in Amherstburg right now, I, I think they'd be more than willing to work with us. And, and, and you know, you brought up Smith Side Road. I was going to bring that up, Deputy Mayor. Uh, to me, to me, that should be an embarrassment to that municipality. Here we did our side. And, and I know, I know uh, myself and I know Councillor Bondi 
uh, we really tried to get Amherstburg to do their side too at the same time. Uh, to me, it would have been cheaper in the long run, but they, they decided to come along and just patch it up. Uh, I use the road quite a bit. Uh, it's a mess. And their response was that their residents do not use that road. It was all people coming out of Colchester and Colchester South, which, uh, which is false. And that's why they didn't do it. But I agree with what you're saying, Deputy Mayor. Uh, it'd be nice to sit down, have a roundtable discussion with them on Coam Park and, and Smith Side Road. Uh, that should be done. That should have been done a long time ago. They continue to come along and patch it up. And the road's a mess. If, if anybody's traveled that road on that side, it's a mess and uh, can cause uh, automob automobile uh, damage to their, uh, to their car. So it's a shame that uh, to me, they should be embarrassed really. So, but I agree with what you're saying, Deputy Mayor. Uh, it's time that we sit down with them. And I think right now, Amherstburg uh, with the mayor and Deputy Mayor and their council, I think they have a, have a good council and good mayor and Deputy Mayor. I think we can make some progress there. At Coen Park, uh, if you're talking Coen Park, if you look on the west side when you're going through McGregor, going, going south, that that subdivision, that newer subdivision, subdivision back in there, those residents all use uh, Coen Park. So I think that's what we have to do. We have to drive it into them, and maybe it should be a 50-50 split there in that part. So that's my opinion, but uh, I agree with what you're saying, Deputy Mayor. Thank you. Okay, good. Great discussion. Um, Deputy Mayor Malosh, we move down to the list. Uh, if you want to um, provide some details on the splash pad, I know we've touched on it, but I think it, it warrants its own discussion as well. I'll leave that I think with you. That, uh, just briefly give you some history here. Back in 2000, and the term that we were of council from 2006 to 2010, I think it was, uh, we decided that we were going to move forward with splash pads. And uh, we we decided that um, we wanted to, at some point in time, we wanted a splash pad in each ward. And what we did was we decided to, even though Essex Center was the one with the most people and would have probably got the most use we felt, we decided to go with Harrow Ward 4 because there's always this sentiment for some reason that Harrow never gets anything. So we thought, well, you know what we're going to do? We're going to make a good gesture here. We're going to put that first splash pad that we have of the four in Harrow Center. And we did that and it was a big hit. Everybody loved the splash pad. Um, and we put a, an expensive system in there. I think it was, um, we were recirculating the water. And uh, I don't know if that's still the same system that we have now. But, uh, and then a few years later, we were gonna put one in Essex and then uh, it came up that they were building the uh, pirate ship uh, place center in uh, Colchester. So we decided, you know what? Good gesture again. Let's put the second splash pad in uh, Colchester. And this was all supposed to happen over a relatively short period of time. Um, Morley probably, Councillor Bowman probably remembers this as well. Uh, the next one, it's just common sense. We have seven, 8,000 people living in Essex Center out of our 20,000 people. It makes sense that we should have a splash pad in that center. Not to mention, um, you know, you've got Cottom and, and people from Lakeshore and, and so on that are come to that center as well. So we went ahead with the splash pad in Essex Center. And now I don't know how many years we've had that, maybe three years in Essex Center, maybe four, I'm, I'm not quite sure. Um, and then all of a sudden, because the crowds changed on, on uh, who's making the decisions on council here, and that sort of got lost. Um, you know, it was, it was something that, was, that we had decided as a strategy for the entire town uh, to bring cohesiveness to the town so that every center would have a splash pad. And now here we get to McGregor, uh, the last one that's supposed to be getting their splash pad, and we're dragging our feet in, in trying to make that happen. So that, that's all that I wanna say on that issue. And, and I'm hoping that this council has, um, you know, even if we put money away for it in the next budget, maybe, uh, if we can't afford it, maybe. And then the year after that, we have enough money that we can put the splash pad in, in McGregor. Uh, maybe do it in two years or maybe even three years if we feel that we have to go three years. But I think it's something we really need to do for the residents of that community. That's all I have to say on the splash pad. Okay, great. Uh, Councillor Bondi? 
Thank you. I'm not opposed to looking at a, a fourth splash pad, but I also think we, we have to look at the whole picture too. And what I've noticed with my time on council is we've added and added and added um, capital projects without um, always adding staff. Right. Um, we have a lot of staff, especially from the Harold Colchester area that run to McGregor to take care of a lot of the McGregor uh, facilities. And it's just a lot. So we have to look at um, not only the capital costs, but we have to look at the, the operating costs and see if this is something that we want to continue with capital and operating. Um, I do like splash pads. Um, I have little kids and I bring them to splash pads um, all the time. I also really believe that splash pads need to be paired with a park. You can't have a splash pad in the middle of nowhere. Like the Essex splash pad needs some more trees and it needs a playground because it's it gets boring. Splash pads are good for 10 minutes, then you go, they go play on the park and then they go somewhere else. We need we need to have a, a planning session about, you know, parks, can we, uh, you know, splash pads where we want it, is there a park next to it? Is there enough trees next to it? The splash pad in Essex has three trees and it is super hot and all, everybody's crowded under the trees on the hot days. On the really hot days, you can't even use a splash pad because there's no shade. So we have to think, um, we have to plan it. I'm, I'm in favor of putting uh, you know, 50, 100 grand away a year and then looking at it, which is what we did for Essex actually. And then we tendered um, to a price. Um, so I'm in favor of looking at it, but I think we, we can't just go, McGregor needs a splash pad and do it. We have to look at the corresponding operating and also the planning to make sure it's in a good spot and uh, we can handle it all. Thank you. Doug, I'm going to go to Doug first before I come back to you, Deputy Mermelo. Uh, through Chair, just uh, regarding Essex splash pad, uh, Council has approved in this year's budget, if you recall, we are moving the top park to go uh, next to the splash pad that'll be in the fall so will be practically used next year but that is happening um, and our manager Jake has been working with um, getting shade structures around our splash pads in Essex Center but also parks because that's becoming a different thing from the climate change adapt adaptation plan um, shade in our parks so we we've heard we've heard you we've heard the residents and we are looking at those things Okay, good. Uh, Deputy Mayor Malash. Mr. Chair, I just want to talk about operating costs for McGregor. Actually, we don't have a lot of operating costs for McGregor. Uh, we've got a community center that's pretty well self-sufficient, and the park there is handled by uh, an entirely different board. We fund them some money uh, on an annual basis to take care of the park. But other than that, there's nothing in McGregor. Uh, we've got a self-sufficient community center along with a play structure in front of it. Um, there's nothing owing on the building or the property or anything like that. Um, so we don't really put a lot of money into the McGregor area um, as far as operating costs go. I mean, if you talk about Colchester, you got the harbor and you got a, a few parks uh, along the waterfront. And you've got the, the old school. Uh, Harrow's got an arena. It's got a big park. It's got uh, num numerous parks spread out throughout the, uh, throughout the community. And um, really, when you talk about the 2,000 residents of uh, McGregor, it's not that far from being pretty close to the population of Harrow. Um, and then you get Essex Center, of course, there's a lot more people there, but we don't spend a lot of money on operating costs for Parks and Rec, I, I believe, in, in McGregor. Um, that's all I had to say. I saw your hand up there. I don't know if you wanted, before I go to Councillor Bondi, if you some info. Uh, just I think what Councillor was referring to is there's no staff on site. So I, anything the staff do, for example, the McGregor Community Center, they're traveling, just those travel costs, which are part of our parks operating budget. But I think that's just what she was referring to, not to put words in her mouth, but uh, oh. I think that's. Councillor Bondi. Thank you. It, it certainly wasn't a slight saying McGregor, is, you know, getting its fair share. I've, I'm glad we have a, uh, you know, McGregor is becoming rejuvenated and we have a strong rep in place. It was just anything we add, we have to think of the staffing towards it. You know, this is something that came up a few years ago when we started looking at splash pads. We, we didn't know what they, co they, they cost us to operate. And it didn't, 
it came out when we had the Hero Splash Pad and we started asking how much is it to operate. And then, um, then we had problems with the water and we have to, everything we do, we have to think of the operating. It's not just everything that we do in McGregor, we have to think of the operating. I, I, I'm pro McGregor as well. I just, we have to think of the operating for everything we do. Uh, Councillor Verbeek. Sure. So thanks everybody for all the comments and thanks for pushing this forward again. I know it's not the first time deputy mayor uh, that you have brought this forward and I appreciate that because you know now that I'm on the ground in that community, I'm hearing about it. And yes, we have a larger population than ward four. And yes, we have um, one park, uh, you know, we have, they have a lot more, but we're not doing us and them. Right. Um, however, we do have to, start looking at um, the residents that have been have been voicing this same concern for quite some time. And I, I'm very grateful that we are gonna to try to have a visioning um, uh, meeting with, <clears throat> with Amherstburg about Coan Park. But I think we just need to have, perhaps we need to look closely at what, what at visioning perhaps just for, for Ward 2, for, for the McGregor area, because as our deputy pointed out, we have a great community center and we have the, the park, but we're kind of, and we're growing community now, as we know, not to mention like we have almost 2000 with the, the trailer park and those subdivisions and nothing for the young people. So um, yeah, I think we do need to, to have a, a look at uh, a vision for this area before we just start, you know, planting a, splash pad here and maybe someday a skate park there because the, all the other parts of our municipality wards in our municipality have one so maybe a, a, a maybe the deputy mayor maybe we'd like to have a visioning on on what we'd like to see come to McGregor and for clarity we have no other property for any of these projects in that area um it, Mr. Sweet My limited knowledge, no, we don't. Um, the property that we have is where the, the uh, community center and Coan Park, so I'm not aware of other property that the uh, town owns. Okay, um, it's five o'clock. So the two hours flies, I know. I, a great discussion. Um, you know, looking forward to development services uh, next month. I'll send the lists out to do the same what we did here in terms of um, getting more ideas generated and getting council to re-rank. I see Doug has his hand up. I think maybe you want to. I just, if we can just do one more, which should be quick, but with the chief on just, it was kind of the next one, the fire station, maybe take another two minutes just with him on. And I think it's another large capital coming up. Sure. We can be done. If council's okay with that, we'll, we'll move on then to, for the last one, then uh, the new Harrow fire station. And that was Richard, our Deputy Mayor Malosh as well, if you want to. You just let the chief go? You want to let the chief you, go and talk about it? Go, that's great. Uh, he knows the question. Okay, he knows the question. So, Chief, if you can repeat the question and then uh, provide your, uh, your summary on that for council and for everybody watching. Uh, yes, if you, uh, in, in our capital budget in 2025, we have... Uh, Put money, put in money for building a new fire station in Harrow. Uh, if you remember back November 2018, we had an architect come in, did a building uh, condition assessment, uh, gave us a feasibility study on refurbishing what we have uh, with an addition and or building a new building. And the cost was virtually it was almost cheaper to build a new building than it was to refurb the one and, and make an addition. Um, I guess where we are now is what we're, we're going to be looking at with, with the, the money in 2025. We'd have to look in uh, our next phase would be uh, look at land, be put, try and determine uh, where the best fit is to put a new fire station in Arrow and, and get the purchase land if uh, we're going to keep going forward. So that's where we are with the, we, the feasibility feasibility study has been completed and that was all presented to council back in 2018. 
Uh, is that the summer you were looking for, Deputy Mayor Malosh? That's what I was looking at. Uh, just having a discussion as to uh, if we feel that that is feasible to let it go to 2025. Um, is our current fire station adequate enough to be able to continue uh, servicing the, the Harrow region with the fire hall that we have and, uh, and that our firefighters can uh, operate uh, efficiently and, and uh, safely in the, in the structure that we have currently. As per the uh, feasibility study, the building needs some repairs. Uh, we've been doing some minor things, and, and I guess we got to keep. Uh, I'll, we'll go back and review all those. And if there's anything, I, we had money in in budget to do some repairs, but we hate to spend good money on bad things, right? I mean, if we're looking at trying to uh, uh, replace the building and build a new one. Uh, we're going to maintain what we got and, and get through the next uh, four years and uh, get a new building. And that's, I, I believe we can do that. Thank you. That's it for okay, me. Thank you. Oh, I see uh, Councillor Garen. Thanks, Chris. If I could just ask one question, just because uh, we've been talking, we got the right people in the room here. Um, I'm going back to the to the parks. Um, we we have on our, our website the Hunter Park playground equipment, the, the design options for the public to vote on. And uh, a question has come back to to me about um, the park that's over off of Stanton. I believe it's Lions Optimus Park. I believe, or that's maybe the old name. Just wondering when the last time we put any money into that park, and if it's even on the radar to be doing anything. Uh, a lot of families in that area now uh, with Stanton being all built up. And uh, my understanding is there's quite a few young families in there and they're using the park more and more. So it, just a question I had that was posed to me and I thought I'd just tie it in. We had the right people in the room. Uh, Councilor Gannon, I appreciate that. I mean, you know, let Doug. I can real quick answer. Um, it is on the radar. We are trying to do a playground um, process in terms of replacement. Um, Hunter Park was kind of in worse condition. It's next, I believe, Stanham Park, just trying to quickly, as you're asking that, is another three or four years for that replacement, um, but also with accessible sidewalks going in at that time. Councillor Bowman. Just a statement, I think, uh, with regard to the fire hall, uh, we all had a uh, good look at that a uh, year ago, and um, it, it obviously needs replacing. I am not a believer in repairing the old and, and refurbishing. Uh, we made that mistake early on in count, uh, my term on council uh, on the, the new uh, town of Essex, and um, we tried to refurb some old buildings and it was turned out to be a disaster. So uh, once you build a new one, you've got something new and uh, moves much, much better. So uh, let's keep that one on the radar and uh, uh, keep it fixed in place to, to be replaced. And uh, uh, again, it's far better to uh, replace it with a new structure than the old. Thank you, Councillor Bowman. Uh, so we've got some procedural wrap up here. Um, Rob? Thank you, Chair. Just real quickly. Um, so if the Committee of the Whole has concluded their discussion for this evening, then on behalf of the presiding officer, I can rise and report to Council uh, that the only formal recommendation that came out of that meeting for Council's consideration tonight was the recommendation related to administration, uh, asking administration to look at the setting of a joint round um, and to that, uh, back to you, Mr. Mayor, uh, we'd be looking for a motion to receive that report of the presiding officer and for council to adopt that noted recommendation. Could I please, uh, Councillor Bowman and a seconder, please? Need a seconder? Uh, Councillor Bjorkman, all in favor? Carrie, thank you. And at this point here, I wanna thank everybody. Um, a lot of very healthy discussion. Um, 
I look forward to the next one. Um, it's very, very good discussion. So at this point here, I'll need a motion to adjourn. Uh, Deputy Mayor Malash and seconder to adjourn. Uh, Councillor Verbeek, all in favor?